live? Good, thank you. Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the third MyHR Facebook Live session. Um, for those of you that are here live, it's really great to have you. If you're watching this after the fact, um, then welcome as well. We do record them so they are available. Uh, this is the third instalment in a monthly series that we intend to continue running. So. Um, stay in touch, like our Facebook page, then you'll get the updates of when these things occur. Um, and yeah, tune in for next time. They're an interactive session, this is live. I'm actually sitting here right now talking to you. The office behind me is the MyHR office, so if anyone does anything silly in the background, you can give them a wave online too. Um, but please ask questions. Um, off camera is someone helping me out, and if questions come through, then I'll do my best to fit that in. We try not to drag these sessions out for too long, so if we get lots of questions or they are particularly difficult questions, we may come back to you, but we will endeavour to post the answers online so everyone gets to see um, what we've said. So that's how it's going to go. My name's Jason. I am the CEO and co-founder of MyHR. MyHR is essentially an outsourced HR function that is enabled by software that we have built. Very clever human resources software that is backed by a team of HR professionals. So we provide support and that is far more tailored and bespoke than traditional software. Uh, lots of AI and lots of uh, cool things going on there. Today's session is on personal grievances, a topic that uh, I'm sure many employers um, love or you may have had experience with. It's really sort of centered around today's session on you know employers, managers, HR managers, people who are receiving the PG as we call them, um, as opposed to an employee centric piece. However, I will talk about employees and the positions they often find themselves in um, as we go through today. So first point, what is a PG or a personal grievance? A personal grievance is essentially a formal complaint made by an employee against an employer. That's basically what it is. There's a list of things you can raise a personal grievance for. They're listed on the ministry's website. I won't go through every single one, but some of the broad categories that you may be familiar with are unfair dismissal or unjustified dismissal, unjustified disadvantage, um, discrimination, um, those, sorts of, uh, those sorts of things. 90-day trial periods is obviously a grievance-free period for unfair dismissal only. Grievances can still be raised for discrimination and disadvantage. Or, as we most commonly see, a trial period can be challenged um, around its validity. So if you have concerns about that one, have a look at our first Facebook Live because we talk specifically about trial periods then. So in that uh, context of what is a PG and how does it work, I'd like to just launch into a bit of a discussion about it, the process, some of the things that you should think about when you receive them, um, and the context in which they might arise. So first of all, just in terms of broader context, we have certainly seen an increase in personal grievances. Um, that's in our own business with the clients we deal with around the country, and we have benchmarked this against some of the larger law firms when we attended a seminar earlier this year. And generally across the industry, there is a sense that personal grievances are on the rise. Um, another thing that's on the rise, a large law firm last month published some stats around increase in awards and payouts, particularly for hurt and humiliation. Hurt and humiliation you may or may not be aware of is covered under Section 123 of the Employment Relations Act. Um, they've increased from an average of four dollars to $7,000 to an average of about $9,000, um, with 20% being at $15,000 and some up to as high as $25,000. So we've certainly seen increase in activity around PGs and in awards being made. Um, and look, a lot of this comes from, um, I think, you know, the failings more often than not in process. Uh, and those are these, the procedural steps you must take when you take any sort of action or significant change. It doesn't have to be a dismissal, it might be a change in somebody's role that could affect the amount they can earn or the location in which they work. Often it relates to a dismissal of some kind, a redundancy, uh, a serious misconduct termination, uh, that could be for performance, it could be for behaviour, it could be for medical reasons, drug reasons, lots and lots of reasons. Um, but in all cases, very prescribed processes need to be followed. And I think I get a general sense that there is um, some frustration, I suppose, from the judiciary around employers continually failing to follow basic process, particularly when they define the process in their employment documents, like employment agreements and policies. So the first tip from me is don't have a disciplinary process prescribed in your employment agreement. There's no need to. Um, the law will outline what you need to do to ensure such a process is fair and reasonable. 
Um, putting that in the employment agreement just adds an extra level of compliance that you don't actually need. So that's sort of step one. People that can't follow their own rules um, are not really looked upon very favorably by the courts. The other thing I want to comment in and around this increase is I don't want this matter to be politicized. Obviously, we're a week and a bit into a new government, but these increases occurred under the previous government. So just be aware that um, the process around these sorts of things has been in place now since the Employment Relations Act came into force, I think, on the 2nd of October in 2000, so 17 years. We see labour inspectors being continuously frustrated going into employers and seeing that they don't have a signed written employment agreement or that um, there are failings in some of the fundamentals of the process. So, you know, be aware that there are things you need to do. Um, don't fight against those processes. The process is critical and it's as important as the substantive justification, the reason you are taking action. Um, plenty of support and advice out there for those um, of you that need help with it. And uh, like I say, you can't shortcut um, these processes. You will potentially get found out. So into PGs, what happens when you get one? Well, um, the first thing I would always say is breathe, be calm, it's okay. Um, it's, it, it's always a bit of a challenge when you receive a personal grievance. A lot of people believe that they can only be received in writing. That's not true. A personal grievance can be raised verbally. However, employees need to be aware when they raise a personal grievance verbally um, that they need to be very specific around what the issues are. The, the, they're not able to simply just say, I have a personal grievance against you, full stop. And the ministry itself goes as far as saying that if an employee is not clear on the reasons for their personal grievance, they may not be able to take legal action down the track. And this is really just a process and a product of good faith. Good faith defines how we operate in an employment relationship. Good faith is reciprocal, it's not one way, it doesn't only apply to employers. Employees must also behave in a way consistent with good faith obligations. And essentially that's just open, honest and transparent communication. So if they have a personal grievance, they really need to explain why, what has happened, why do they feel that they have been disadvantaged or that their dismissal was unfair or that they feel discriminated against. Um, and that's fair enough. Raise the concerns, be specific about those concerns. And that allows an employer to look at them and consider them in the context of what has happened and make a formal reply. So preferably they should be in writing. I think if it is raised verbally, I would encourage you to go back to the employee and ask for it in writing. Then you have the facts. If they refuse, um, ask for the detail from them and make some notes. Um, and then you really then you know what you're working with. If they refuse to provide any more detail other than I have a personal grievance, then just make a note of that fact and we will need to then see how that plays out. In my experience, most of the time you will get it in writing. So you've received your personal grievance. It's there. It alleges that you have done things wrong and correctly that have harmed in some way the employee and therefore some action is being sought. That action generally is in the way of um, some form of payment for lost wages, a payment for hurt and humiliation, um, potentially holiday arrears if there are holiday or leave calculations that have been made incorrectly or not paid for certain reasons, or um, refunds related to unlawful deductions. So these are all of the sorts of areas that money may need to come from an employer to an employee. Um, and the process of resolving the personal grievance will flesh out exactly what those payments need to be. In terms of when you get the grievance, when do you have to reply? Sometimes we see a fairly short and quite unreasonable time frame. The letter arrives, they, they request or demand a response within 24 hours. Um, our advice is that you should reply within 24 hours to acknowledge receipt of the grievance. But you don't actually have to reply with a full response within 24 hours. You obviously have some work to do to investigate what has been claimed in form of you. Um, in our view, 14 days is reasonable and that 14 day period or two week period will allow you the time you need to investigate and formulate a reply to the grievance or to ask clarifying questions if you're not sure about certain points. Um, so don't feel pressured into providing that full reply within 24 hours. Um, take that time, those, those 14 days. Obviously if you start to draw it out beyond that, you really need to show a good reason why. Um, dragging a response out over weeks and months um, can equally uh, be unreasonable from an employer's point of view towards an employee. The other thing I would say in terms of coming up with a resolution is I always like to encourage people to look for that human resolution. Um, we're somewhat conditioned, I think, to think that uh, 
you know, employers are always in court, that we're always fighting with employees, that the, the way almost the press reports on things is it's quite sensationalised. Headlines around thief gets $20,000 payout in the employment court or whatever it is. And sometimes when you dig into the actual case, it's not quite as clear cut as the headline might have us think. Um, I'm sure you all know, employers and managers alike, that the employment relationship works best when um, we all talk and behave like mature adults, right? And that most of the issues in an employment relationship are resolved without any formal action whatsoever. A small number are then dealt with through a personal grievance. A small number of them may proceed to mediation. An even smaller number might go to the Employment Relations Authority and a tiny number in the overall context of number of employees working and might proceed to the employment court. So things don't become litigious until really the very end and the vast majority of employment issues are resolved just by people talking. So look for that option. Look for the um, ability to have a conversation. Um, put yourself in their shoes when you read the personal grievance. I categorise PGs into three types. Uh, one is that that is, I guess, purely speculative. Um, the justification and the process that has been followed was sound, uh, was rock solid. Let's say, for example, it's a restructure resulting in redundancy, clear reasons around why that has happened. Those reasons are commercial. The process was solid, um, and yet somebody is having a go uh, because they might think they can get some compensation out of the process. They're a very small number, I have to be really honest with you. Again, I think there's some fear in this. Fear, you know, people that like to play on fear report in a, in a way that scares employers, that there's just this um, network of employees out there that want to uh, you know, raise grievances with their employers just to make a bit of money. And I just think that's ludicrous. Employees are not like that. The vast majority of Kiwi workers just want to get in, do a good job, they're honest people and they're hardworking people. Every now and then a speculative grievance will arise, however, and they, they do exist. The second category is that where there's perhaps subject to interpretation. You may have done things for good reason, the process you have followed may not have been quite right, or there may be some grey area around that. So really it's a, it's a question of, well, it, maybe it's genuine, uh, maybe it's not. And the third are those where the employer really just finds that they have been caught out. They, they're looking at a situation where they have mucked up, and they haven't done the right thing and the grievance is potentially entirely justified. So those are the three categories. And in terms of your strategy for approaching those, it depends a lot on where you see, the, um, you see them landing. By far and away, category number two is the largest, absolutely. And this is now speaking from 17 odd years of experience in this field um, in New Zealand, the UK and Australia. I would say that there is often in a dispute some genuine and good intent from the employer, um, a process that was uh, followed to some degree, but some mistakes may have been made along the way, but not for any malicious reason. And so a conversation, a debate, um, an argument needs to occur to resolve how this might be sorted out. Um, those at, the either, at either end, the employers that genuinely have done something bad and done so intentionally, or the employees that are just having a go following a um, following a, a, a legitimate process, they are the smaller numbers. Um, and so I think let's park the two categories of what I would call bad employers and bad employees. Um, they certainly exist on both sides, right? And depending on the, the flavour of the article that you might be reading, um, some may have us believe that all employers are awful people and just want to screw over their employees. Others may have a view that employees are, um, are you know, not to be trusted. I think those groups are tiny. Uh, let's get focused on the, on the core group. So there's an argument to be had. There's a personal grievance that has some legitimacy and you need to deal with it. Review what has been alleged, investigate that, and then look for the opportunity to have a conversation. Often personal grievances will move to mediation. If anyone has been to mediation, you'll be familiar with what it is like. Um, it's not court. It's a less formal setting. Lawyers and representatives can attend. A Ministry of Business, Media and Innovation and Employment mediator will be there to mediate the process. They can't bind you by a ruling, but they can help facilitate an outcome. Mediation is very useful, and in my experience, the Ministry's mediators are very good. It's a without prejudice environment, which means people can talk openly and honestly with a view that they resolve the matter before it needs to go to court or to the Employment Relations Authority. However, you can resolve a dispute prior to mediation. 
um, with a conversation potentially. You can agree on what the outcome may be and you can reflect that outcome in a record of settlement document. The Ministry have also now allowed us to register those record of settlement documents directly with them online, so thus avoiding mediation altogether. Um, you agree on the outcome, you sign the record of settlement and you lodge it online. It will be signed off by a ministry mediator. They will phone you, they will phone the employee and, uh, and the matter will be, will be dealt with and, and finished. If you end up in mediation, um, then simply both sides put their case forward. The mediator listens, will ask questions, will look to get a resolution, preferably with everyone in the room, but often will adjourn to two separate rooms and move between those rooms to look at and discuss what has occurred and, and what might happen. If you can't reach a decision at mediation, then it will often, not always, but often then escalate to the Employment Relations Authority. The other thing about mediation is it's voluntary. So in the, um, in the context of, say, a speculative grievance, you're not compelled to go to mediation. As an employer, you can refuse. Um, it may be seen um, as a breach of good faith that you're refusing to talk to your employee, so I would advise some caution around refusing mediation. Um, but if you think there is a genuine and justified reason why um, you should decide not to go, you can put that forward. If the employee then elects to raise it further, and in doing so raise a grievance with the Employment Relations Authority using a, what we call a statement of problem, um, more often than not the authority will direct you to attend mediation anyway. Well, they will. Um, and so you will be back there. So even though it is voluntary, think very carefully about knocking it back, um, because you'll often end up there no matter what. Um, once you get to the authority or the employment court, these are formal um, environments. I would encourage you to make sure you have a, a lawyer with you and, and a good lawyer. Um, everything is documented. It's a matter generally of public record. So um, they are very structured, very formal processes and can take some time. Like I said earlier though, I think there is a very small minority of employment issues that end up at the authority or, or at, the, uh, at the employment court. Most of them are resolved prior. So you've got your PG, you've responded within 24 hours to acknowledge that you've received it. Dear so, Sir, Madam, thank you, we've received the personal grievance for employee. We are reviewing the matters that you've raised and we commit to providing a response within 14 days or come back with clarifying questions. So a grievance acknowledged. You then set about looking at what's been put forward and getting a response together so you can reply. Um, I'd encourage you to reply in writing and then to follow it up with that conversation to see if there's a, a way you might resolve the matter um, then and there. Uh, and that is, uh, that is, I think, how most personal grievances are resolved. Um, a comment on the payments and the settlement, hurt and humiliation. Uh, certain people have a bit of a hard time understanding this. Um, they feel that there hasn't been any genuine hurt and humiliation, so why is this being raised? Um, and look, I have to say, uh, in defence of employees, there are certainly cases where people are genuinely uh, hurt and humiliated by the process that they have been a part of. But the other thing about this is these settlement payments under Section 123 of the Employment Relations Act are tax free. Um, so it becomes an area to put a payment that doesn't become subject to a PAYE. And this is often one of the things that is talked about through the resolution process um, because it allows an employee to perhaps uh, have access to more funds that they don't pay tax on. Um, so look, that's, that's sort of the overall, I guess. In terms of your own strategy, it's a little bit difficult for me to give direct guidance on how to handle it. What I would say is think a little bit about things like the cost of pursuing um, this, the cost of fighting the grievance. Think a little bit too about the principle of the matter. Um, and think also about the risk to your reputation if it becomes public. Um, I do often see uh, some employers or employer advocates rushing to settle just to say, look, you don't want this going any further, it will be costly, it will you know, take a lot of money, whatever, whatever, whatever. Um, if what you've done is genuine, for good reason, and you've followed a good process, um, I'm always reluctant to suggest you settle early. Um, where things are, say, a matter of principle and perhaps deserve to be um, dealt with and confronted, um, then do so. You know, this is not always just about um, employers behaving badly. This is sometimes about a genuine handling of, of employees not doing the right thing. Um, so assess those, those risks, assess the risk to your business, the time it may take and the cost when you're determining whether you settle or not. Um, and that is pretty much a summary of the personal grievance process, some of the reasons that we see, how I sort of recommend you handle it. 
Um, and everything, I'll just, are we all good? Yeah? Okay. So if there are any questions, please post them. What's happened last uh, in the last two, we've, we've had questions after the fact. I will deal with those um, at the next one next month, or we might post them on the Facebook page for people to read. Um, so please feel free, digest what I've said, think on it. Uh, it's a fairly contentious topic, um, no doubt, and uh, you know people will often have lots of views, comments, or questions about it. So please feel free to fire through any of those views, comments, or questions. We're always keen to answer them, and as always, provide our support uh, and guidance in a really simple, easy to understand way. So once again, it's been a pleasure talking to the camera and knowing that someone out there is listening. I look forward to next month. If you've got any ideas about topics we might cover or things that might interest you, please fire them through. We're always open to, uh, to hearing from you. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.